Hi there. Uh, I'm going to be talking here about the history of American sociology, or at least like the origins of sociology in the United States, um, but also uh, about scholars um, who have been, you know, sort of marginalized within the discipline and probably need to be brought more front and center. Um, and the reason that they have been marginalized is very much has to do with issues of race and gender um, and institutionalized forms of um, discrimination and just the way in which certain people's intellectual contributions are uh, made to matter and other people's are kind of left to the dustbin. Um, so I'll talk about like the Chicago School of Sociology here in terms of the origins or development of sociology because the Chicago School um, was really formative. You know, this is a group of uh, scholars and researchers and, you know, a, a kind of an eclectic bunch of uh, academics based at the University of Chicago um, who really helped you know, played, played a, a crucial role in institutionalizing sociology as a legitimate academic uh, subject in the United States uh, in connection, you know, with these other social sciences uh, that we see here, especially the big ones like psychology, economics, political science, uh, and anthropology. Um, and we will also, though, look at somebody who um, has had a huge intellectual uh, influence in, in multiple um, disciplines, but for some reasons has not been necessarily given credit for the role that he played in helping to develop sociology. Um, and that is the great uh, African-American uh, intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and so I will talk uh, a lot about uh, Du Bois's works, uh, the way that he contributed to the development of sociology, and also the attempts that have been made more recently to kind of rehabilitate his central role within sociology, um, the role that he played in, in helping to develop our, our discipline. Similarly, um, we will talk about the role that women uh, who were associated, some of whom were associated with the University of Chicago, but some of them were sort of um, working within Chicago, but you know, like only tangentially or outside of the university setting, you know, often in a more kind of like social reform kind of um, uh, uh, milieu. <clears throat> and um, these, this, uh, you know, will include a group of women called, you know, the, the Women's School of Sociology uh, uh, in Chicago. Um, and also, you know, reformers like uh, Jane Addams and Florence Kelly. Jane Addams, of course, being the founder of the famous uh, settlement house uh, known as Whole House. <clears throat> So just a, a short kind of timeline here to orient you and, and notice here that the timeline very much overlaps with when uh, Emil Durkheim is uh, in working in, in France to basically institutionalize sociology as an academic discipline in the university system there. You know, this timeline of roughly uh, the 1890s and the early 1900s. So in 1891, the first uh, sociology program in the United States is founded uh, at the University of Kansas uh, in conjunction with um, the uh, history, uh, uh, the, the study of history. Uh, fun fact, I actually spent a little time teaching at the University of Kansas in the sociology department. Um, the following year uh, is when the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago, the, the, the famous Chicago School, would be founded by Professor Abion Small. 
Uh, and Small would later go on and publish the first like textbook of sociology, an introduction to the study of society. So, you know, these are kind of like the, the first um, fundamental components of, you know, establishing a discipline is, you know, you have a department at a university and you have a textbook and you're starting to kind of like formulate now the idea of a, um, you know, the, of a legitimate academic study, field of study. <clears throat> the next year, in 1895, you have, you know, the leading journal or one of the leading journals to this day um, that has established the American Journal of Sociology, still going strong in 2021, um, published by the University of Chicago Press. And then uh, the fall, you know, in 1905, uh, the development of the American Sociological Society. Uh, I, I wish they had kept their original name because their acronym would be ASS, um, but they uh, renamed themselves to become the American Sociological Association, the ASA. And that to this day is also um, the leading professional organization where sociologists get together um, every summer um, or at least they used to in you know, the pre-COVID times, uh, get together at some random hotel convention center and you know, give pa uh, papers uh, and talk about their research for you know, four days. Um, and uh, it's also where you know, like job interviews and, and this kinds of, these kinds of activities where awards are given, where people debate um, over you know, particularly influential books. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of the central gathering place for, uh, not the only one, but it is like the, the largest on a national scale um, meeting, a uh, professional meeting of sociologists. So that goes back, you know, 116 years. So when we talk about the Chicago School, um, like I said, this is a really an eclectic group of um, thinkers and, and researchers <laughs> who, you know, based at the University of, of Chicago would, would really, you know, help to develop sociology as a, as a, as a science uh, in the early 20th century. So, you know, the, <clears throat> the idea that sociology could be a science, that it could, that it could apply like, you know, the methods of um, the natural sciences, like, you know, physics and chemistry and biology, you know, that you could apply those same methods uh, to the study of society, you know, in the sense of, you know, starting with a research question or a hypothesis even, and, and then having a particular kind of methodology that, you know, is supposed to be rigorous and non-biased and objective, um, situated within a larger field of literature, all that stuff that is, you know, considered the scientific method um, was, you know, what, you know, sociologists going all the way back to Auguste Comte in France, you know, in the early 19th century, had hoped to institutionalize um, to make sociology, you know, a, a sort of a legitimate academic field and one in which like these scientific methods could be, um, you know, applied to the study of not just the natural physical world, but like this, the social human world. <clears throat> so starting in um, 1892, like, you know, we saw with the timeline, the Chicago School rises to international prominence as a center of advanced sociological thought. Um, its peak is really in these years in the early 20th century between roughly 1915 and 1935. Um, and they were especially groundbreaking this collection of scholars um, in terms of their research, uh, in terms of the work that they did uh, based in the city of Chicago. It's kind of like they treated the city of Chicago as their laboratory of study. And the city of Chicago is a super dynamic place at this time. I mean, it still is, but at that time you had, you know, uh, groups of immigrants coming from all, you know, kinds of different places. You had an industrializing, uh, you know, 
one of the world's leading economies at that point. Um, you had just a, it, it was a real hub of activity and uh, also of inequality and, and poverty and, you know, suffering and homelessness and the same, you know, kinds of dynamics that are, you know, just as evident to us in, in 2021. So their research in uh, to the urban environment in Chicago was especially important in the way that they combined uh, theoretical uh, insights or theoretical hypotheses with uh, field work, with uh, statistical work into the um, city of Chicago, but especially with the development of ethnographic field work. Uh, which, you know, as many of you may have known or, or studied uh, or participated in is a, you know, a kind of an offshoot of anthropology in the sense that, you know, we study uh, qualitatively the way in which people create meaning and use symbols and um, the sort of day-to-day -day living of people and uh, how they make sense of the world and, and how they survive. So that sort of ethnographic field work, a lot of it was, um, you know, kind of pioneered at the University of Chicago. Although, um, as we will uh, see in a minute, um, before, you know, the University of Chicago had even done that, W.E.B. Du Bois had already uh, launched a major ethnographic study of the black population in Philadelphia going way back into 1899. We'll talk about that study a bit more here in a minute. Um, after World War II, there's a kind of a resurgence of um, the, you know, a new Chicago school. Um, again, their insights were predominantly into ethnographic field uh, research and ethnographic field work. Um, and, but then combining that with the theoretical insights of, of what came to be known as symbolic interactionism. So, you know, again, this, this kind of cultural, uh, almost anthropological um, approach to the way in which people create meaning and use symbols um, that, that this went hand in hand with their ethnographic field research and, uh, you know, created a whole new body of influential sociology. Um, but uh, for those contributions of the University of Chicago, that's, you know, that's kind of like the mainstream, like, you know, most uh, textbooks or most standardized accounts of, um, the, you know, the development of sociology in the United States would center on um, the University of Chicago and the Chicago School. And I, I don't want to minimize their contributions um, but uh, one effect of that narrative, of course, has been to marginalize other uh, contributors and other people who have played a central role in the discipline. Um, one of whom, as I mentioned, is W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, now, W.E.B. Du Bois is, is a very well-known intellectual, um, somebody who has had a tremendous influence uh, to this day, um, particularly for his role in the black struggle for uh, you know, racial equality in the United States. Um, but he's generally not um, given uh, the credit that he is due to be, in terms of being thought of as like one of the founders of sociology. Like within sociology, his uh, legacy, his influence, his contribution has been kind of marginalized. Um, you know, he is generally not included in these kinds of narratives that center on um, the Chicago School and the Chicago School research. Du Bois was writing, um, you know, was, was sort of a peer uh, writing in these times. He led an extraordinary life, uh, you know, going from 1868 to 1963. So in other words, this is a man who um, was born, uh, you know, only three years after slavery had been fully abolished. And he died uh, on the night before Martin Luther King gave his I have a dream speech. So, so his lifespan like literally 
you know, uh, went through the, the entire history of, of Jim Crow uh, in the United States. And in 1900, uh, he says this thing that, you know, is, is one of his most um, oft quoted um, um, things that he, he had said. He says, you know, the, the, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And remember, he's being, he's being prophetic here. He's, he's, he's saying this in 1900. He's looking into the future. He says, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America, and the islands of the seas. Notice, very important thing. He is saying that, you know, the, the problem of the 20th century is going to be the problem of the color line, but not only in the United States, not only in America, but globally, worldwide. Um, as we'll see, like, for example, on the eve of World War I, he talks about how imperialism, European imperialism in Africa um, is basically uh, plunging the world into um, this, you know, uh, god awful collision course that would become World War One, uh, in which millions of people uh, would die, pretty much for no fucking reason uh, except for like, you know, nationalism and, and, and imperialism. So, um, so you know, just note here that like Du Bois from the beginning has a. Uh, a global framework for understanding the problem of race and racism. Um, and so, you know, he, he would write, most of what he would write, um, you know, in the next 60 years or so would be focused on race relations in the United States. But he always had framed things and, and thought of himself as an internationalist. Um, as somebody who, who saw these problems in a truly global sense. So just to give you, you know, some trajectory of the, of the man's life and, and his, his biography is a, is a very important part of shaping his ideas. You can't really like separate his um, life experiences from um, his sociological analysis. Uh, du Bois is born, you know, in, 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 uh, in Massachusetts in 1868. He attends uh, Fisk University, which is a historically black college in, in Tennessee. Um, I think it still exists to this day. Um, and in 1895, he becomes the first uh, African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard University. Uh, he goes on from there to become a professor of history, economics, and sociology at Atlanta University, a uh, university which does not exist anymore or uh, is now known, I guess, as Clark Atlanta University, basically a, a private um, university. But his move um, from Massachusetts to Atlanta has, a, as we will see, a formative impact on uh, Du Bois. Du Bois is now basically like a, a black person in the in the in the belly of the beast of Jim Crow uh, in the in the city of Atlanta in 1897. Um, in uh, you know in 1899 he will then publish a work that I'm going to talk about more in the next slide that is really formative for the development of sociology. Um, in terms of its use of methods uh, and in terms of the development of ethnographic fieldwork and, and surveys and interviewing and those kinds of methods. Um, and that is a book called The Philadelphia Negro, a uh, book that um, was based on a, a study of what was then, you know, the, the largest black community <clears throat> in America or the largest urban black community in America. Uh, the, the city of Philadelphia. <clears throat> and then um, in 1900, he attends the first Pan-African conference in London. <clears throat> and um, as I mentioned with that earlier quote, this is something we always have to keep in mind with Du Bois is the international scale of his sociological theory. That, you know, from the beginning, he really understood that uh, racism 
uh, was connected to imperialism and that this was something that had to be addressed on an international scale. And so he begins to think of himself as a, uh, a pan-Africanist and uh, in the sense of like uniting people of African descent, uh, you know, uh, all around the world, um, not, you know, obviously not just in Africa, but in the Caribbean and in the United States, people who are descendants of enslaved people. And, and it's it here in 1900 that he, um, he, he says this famous thing about the, the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line. So the, the Philadelphia Negro here again, like it, it, it predates um, a lot of this uh, Chicago school kind of study in the sense that, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're going back here to, to 1899. Whereas, you know, like I said, a lot of the, the first, you know, sh sh major Chicago school studies um, using field work didn't really appear until like maybe, you know, 15, years later. So this is a really groundbreaking book um, in the sense that he went out and, you know, studied, uh, like I said, the largest black community uh, in the United States at this time. You, you got to remember in 1899, um, the majority of black Americans are still living in the South. Um, this is before the time that would come to be known as the Great Migration where the majority of the African-American population would migrate out of the South um, into uh, the cities of the United States. So at this point, most Black Americans are um, uh, in the South and living in rural communities. So the Philadelphia Negro um, does present this you know, study of um, uh, the, the black population in Philadelphia uh, in the seventh ward of, of the city. I don't really know Philadelphia, so I don't really know what uh, where the seventh ward might be located. Um, but he goes and does this very extensive research, uh, you know, some five thousand surveys and interviews. I mean, to this day, if you did, you know, five thousand surveys and interviews, that would be considered. Um, you know, quite extensive research methodology. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really kind of groundbreaking um, in the sense of, you know, purely from the standpoint of, of the methods that were used <clears throat> and that would, it would kind of set a template for what the Chicago school would later do in terms of using like the city as, as a laboratory, you know, putting it under a microscope and, and looking at different communities and different neighborhoods, you know, questions about poverty, discrimination, uh, families, crime, gangs, like all that stuff uh, is in here. And um, the Chicago School, you know, basically, uh, you know, came to be like pretty um, uh, highly regarded within sociology. But you know, Du Bois was doing this, wasn't doing this earlier. <clears throat> Again, some more biographical timeline. Um, in 1900, Du Bois, and at this point, he's you know become a, a pretty prominent scholar, very um, well-regarded scholar in in the country. He engages in this debate with Booker T. Washington. Um, over the role of uh, education for black people. It's a pretty famous debate because Washington was basically arguing that like, you know, um, black people should be, you know, should be allowed to go to school, but uh, they should be, you know, taught like kind of vocational kinds of training, like, you know, um, things that would basically help them become like better workers um, so that they could, you know, provide value for the capitalist class. Du Bois uh, rejected this idea and, you know, for Du Bois, um, Black people had as much a right as anybody to being, you know, to uh, learning, you know, art and culture and 
philosophy and science, uh, a well-rounded kind of Renaissance education. Um, keep in mind that this was this is something that was intensely controversial, um, you know, throughout the slave era. Uh, you know, th there had been active conscious efforts to make sh to keep black people from being educated to prevent black people from being educated um you know at, to, you know like even just from being able to read and write uh you know people had if the, if you wanted to learn to read and write you would have to like do that like in secret if you were you know an enslaved or most most enslaved people that was the case <clears throat> Um, in 1903, uh, Du Bois publishes his most, probably his most well-known book, um, The Souls of Black Folk, a compilation of essays that had appeared in the Atlantic Monthly and, and other journals. And um, to this day is a, uh, something people still read um, because of the sort of the beauty of the, the prose um, and the kind of, um, the way that the insights are still so timely in terms of um, like the, the, the social psychology of, of racism and, and the sociology of racism. In 1905, um, the Niagara movement uh, held with other black civil rights leaders in opposition to Booker T. Washington and the uh, so-called Atlanta Compromise. So again, this kind of ongoing debate. Um, this is a really intense period uh, in um, the city of Atlanta, especially, like I said, in the, in the, in the belly of the beast of Jim Crow um, at, the, at, the, at the heart of um, this, heart is really not the right word. <laughs> Um, at, the, at the center of this uh, awful, evil system. Um, there are these, you know, like race riots in, in 1906 in, in which like these mobs of white people, you know, rampage through the streets of Atlanta, beating people, lynching people, any black people that they could basically find. This didn't only happen in Atlanta, of course, like, you know, in Chicago and Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, Washington, D.C. You have, you know, these similar kinds of like rampages of um, white violence, especially as more and more black people are getting out of the south and uh, migrating to the cities in the north. So um, Chicago becomes a real uh, flashpoint. And many of you probably know about, you know, the, the Tulsa race riot of, of 1921 uh, in, in which, you know, the, the Klan and, and uh, uh, you know, basically these white mobs uh, rampaged through what was then known as, as Black Wall Street in, uh, in Tulsa. Um, Du Bois is kind of this, this environment of like Jim Crow segregation and, and violence is having a kind of increasingly radicalizing effect on Du Bois uh, in the next uh, iteration of his scholarly work. He publishes a, a uh, biography of the white abolitionist, John Brown. Um, remember John Brown is, you know, somebody who had uh, attempted to start a uh, an armed revolt among the slaves in 1859 um, with an attack on uh, Harper's Ferry in Virginia, where they, you know, uh, took a whole bunch of guns, and he was, you know, basically trying to arm uh, the enslaved population there. Uh, Brown had been a, a lifelong abolitionist who had also participated in the very bloody um, wars in uh, Kansas in the 1850s, uh, wars between pro-slavery and anti-slavery people that basically led up to the Civil War. He's an enormously uh, important person in terms of this period of American history. 
um, and somebody who had been really kind of like, you know, reviled, um, hated, and and the his, histories of of John Brown had been really kind of distorted, and so Du Bois set out to you know set the record straight. In 1910. Du Bois goes on and then forms the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, still um, going strong today uh, in terms of <clears throat> a um, legal defense of equality, uh, of racial equality. So Du Bois decides, uh, you know, suggests the use of, of colored rather than black in order to include dark-skinned people everywhere. <clears throat> so, as I said, like, you know, kind of unlike, you know, say like Durkheim or Weber, Du Bois is someone who's like, his biographical experience is deeply connected with his sociological theory. Um, and so in his most, famous book, uh, The Souls of Black Folk. It really draws upon his biographical experience to illuminate the reality of race in the United States. And it explores um, the topic of subjectivity because he believed that race and racism did not simply work at a strictly rational level. We needed something like a, like a kind of a a social psychological explanations for like the irrationalities of like, you know, hatred and, and fear that fuel white racism. So the, the souls of black folk is important theoretically because um, it contains these concepts that people invoke to this day to talk about like the, the, the social psychological dimensions of racism. Um, you know, it has this concept of the color line, but especially this, this concept of double consciousness in which Du Bois wrote about how black people internalize a dual um, sense of themselves, a one a sense of um, who they are, but another sense of, how white people perceive them or look at them. And that you therefore um, have this kind of alienated, fragmented, dualized kind of consciousness. He similarly wrote about the concept of the veil um, in another way of like, you know, talking about the social psychology of white racism and then the impact that it has on black Americans. Um, and black people, not just in America. Du Bois maintain that, you know, once the color line had begun to pay dividends in the 15th century, like so historically, he traces this all the way back to, you know, slavery and the conquest of the Americas, <clears throat> the exploitation of Africa uh, and African people. Um, it was then um, and only then that race became central to world history. So in other words, he's offering, a, he's beginning to offer like a materialist understanding of race, that it was always fundamentally connected to a system of economic exploitation, um, of slavery, of empire, um, of uh, thing, you know, things where racism was used to legitimate or justify um, a kind of the, the material interests of um, a ruling class or an empire. <clears throat> In 1910, Du Bois uh, leaves Atlanta, um, goes to New York to become the editor of the NAACP's monthly magazine, The Crisis. Um, this becomes the leading news outlet for Black America um, in the 19 teens and, and reaches, you know, its, its circulation is uh, 100,000 across the country by 1920. Du Bois, 
you know, as if he's not like busy enough, kind of dashes off and writes his first novel, uh, writes uh, some, you know, theater for the stage, a uh, play called the, the Star of Ethiopia. Um, he's just a, you know, in some sense, like kind of an old school um, intellectual, um, what they, you know, might have once called a Renaissance man, you know, somebody who, had uh, so many different abilities and interests and, and um, mediums in which he could express his ideas. In 1915, um, with the world headed towards, uh, well, with the world already in the midst of World War I, um, but before you know, the United States had joined the, uh, the war, but with Europe basically uh, killing each other in uh, this horrible trench warfare. Du Bois writes this essay, The African Roots of War, that argues that, you know, the, the scramble to colonize Africa was, had been at the root cause of World War I. And so this, you know, consolidates uh, his views about capitalism, imperialism, and racism and their interconnections. Um, the crisis is, in, in the meantime, uh, you know, doing this kind of journalistic work, but also doing, um, you know, what in some ways was like sociological data collection by, um, you know, doing research on lynching, which had um, reached, you know, a real peak as a form of racial terrorism. Um, in the United States at this point, the crisis tabulated, um, you know, as, as part of its kind of active campaign against lynching, started um, tabulating and doing research on it and tabulated some uh, 2,732 lynchings between 1884 and 1914. It's, again, in this period of extraordinary... Um, racial terrorism and uh, Du Bois again has to be seen as somebody who's both an, uh, an intellectual and an activist in this in this struggle at the same time. So after World War I Du Bois steps up his demands for emancipation his work becomes more aggressive like I said the, the environment the social environment shapes his ideas and continued to push him in a more uh, kind of radical direction. Um, with World War I, you know, the situation, you know, at, after the war was, you know, you had all these uh, black soldiers who had, you know, signed up and, um, or, you know, were coming home from battle and, you know, supposedly they had gone off to fight for like freedom and democracy and, and against like, you know, totalitarianism and, you know, authoritarianism and, and empire. And then they come back to the United States, you know, after having like risked life and limb, um, they come back to the United States only to find themselves being treated like second class citizens. Um, you know, in a, a segregated country, a country that wasn't just segregated in the South, by the way, it was like, this was not simply a Southern problem. And so, you know, this, this same contradiction would arise again after World War II and, and would be a really important impetus for the rise of the civil rights movement, you know, that you had this this real disconnect between on the one hand, you know, um, asking Black Americans to go and, you know, overseas and, you know, risk life and limb in a, you know, fight a, uh, for freedom and democracy, um, you know, against, you know, fascism and, and uh, totalitarianism. And then come back, you know, only to be subject to, you know, this like Jim Crow kind of forms of segregation. So this kind of 
disconnect would be an impetus towards um, movements for racial justice in the United States and racial equality in the United States. Um, in his next book uh, that we see here, you know, Dark Water, um, Du Bois writes an essay called The Souls of White Folk, um, as opposed to The Souls of Black Folk. And he starts to, to kind of say, okay, well, let's take a look at white people and like what makes like white racism tick. Um, and one of the things that he comes across that we're still talking about this to this day is the invisibility of white privilege to white people. Um, the way in which like white privilege is kind of, you know, taken for granted and, you know, um, part of the problem of, of just being able to um, have a discussion about that is just the way in which like white privilege is just kind of, you know, not seen as privilege, <laughs> just not, it, not seen, it, it's just rendered invisible. Um, and so Du Bois basically says that, you know, whereas like black Americans have, you know, this thing he's called double consciousness, um, white people seem to be kind of ob oblivious to racial consciousness whatsoever. Um, his international work continues here after World War I, um, you know, a lot of that stuff that he had been doing was kind of interrupted by the First World War. Um, but after the war, he's able to go back to Europe um, in 1919 and then again in 1921 to meet um, for meetings of the Pan-African Congress. Um, this time he is, you know, basically actively being spied upon by the United States government. He's viewed as a uh, threatening, subversive, uh, intellectual, um, which he kind of was, um, but, you know, like the U.S. government has kind of identified him as, as an enemy to, at this point. And um, here he gets now involved in another debate. He kind of moved on. The, the, the debate with Booker T. Washington has kind of moved on, but now in the 1920s, he gets involved uh, in a debate with Marcus Garvey, you know, the famous proponent of the, the Back to Africa movement um, in uh, basically said like, you know, look, black Americans, like white people are never going to accept you. Uh, we need to go back, uh, you know, and, and establish, uh, you know, colonies in, in Africa. Um, <clears throat> du Bois, to uh, umbrage against this argument, they, you know, were engaged in a, a series of, de of debates in the crisis um, through the 1920s. Um, in uh, 1933, finally leaves the crisis uh, and then returns back to Atlanta um, to teach at the first university that, that had hired him um, after he'd gotten his PhD at Atlanta University. And here, his, again, his political perspective um, is becoming more and more radicalized and he begins to turn more and more towards Marxism um, as a method for understanding the, you know, ways in which like class inequalities and class struggles are connected with the struggles of black people in the United States. So he writes a series of articles, um, you know, uh, in, that basically support Marxist theories of society and economics. You have to remember, in in the early 1930s, this is this is the the depths of the Great Depression in in America and and worldwide. And in the 1930s, um, you know. Marxism and you know, sort of like um, Marxist movements, the Communist Party, the the Socialist Party, um, the labor movement, all of these things are you know all of these forms of uh, activism and these forms of um, intellectual radicalism are really coming to the fore in the early 1930s because 
capitalism uh, is failing, unemployment rate is something like you know 25 percent, and um, on the right wing you have uh, you know there's these movements of fascism. You know you have Mussolini in Italy uh, in 1933. You will have you know Hitler coming to power in Germany, um, and from the left you have this uh, surge of you know, again, in, in throughout uh, Europe and as, as well as in the United States, you have this surge of uh, the labor movement, of uh, people being drawn to socialism and communism and being people being drawn to Marxist ideas because they seem to, to make a lot of sense. <laughs> Marxism seems to make a lot of sense in 1933. And Du Bois is one of the folks that, you know, begins to adopt this kind of framework and that will um inspire what i think is his greatest book um and i think is is possibly the greatest work of marxist historiography ever written uh is this book called black reconstruction in america uh is a 700 page epic um and and really a, a tragedy um, uh, because it, it tells the story of America between these, these, these pivotal years between 1860 and 1880. So in other words, like from, um, the, before the civil war and, and, uh, with slavery and then the, through the civil war that begins in 1861 and ends in 1865. And then through the period of reconstruction that goes from 1865 through 1877. So it's this really like pivotal, uh, pivotal um, period in American history. And the way that Du Bois puts it in the first few pages of the book um, that kind of encapsulates this, this tragic narrative is uh, the slave went free stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. That single quote kind of encapsulates the thread of the whole book in terms of the way that new possibilities were opened with emancipation and the end of slavery. And then the ways very tragically in which black people were moved back into a position that was not slavery, but was basically like the closest thing to it um, in the Jim Crow, uh, in Jim Crow America. So this book that's published in 1935 in, in, in the middle of the depression. So basically in the, in the middle of the great depression, Du Bois is being influenced by Marxism and he goes back you know, and, he, and so he, he wants to do this historical work in which he looks back to the previous century um, and into this period of the Civil War and Reconstruction to kind of figure out like, like where everything kind of went wrong in a way. Like he's, he's trying to like, like an archeologist kind of like trace things back um, to the root of the problem. And so this Marxist interpretation of, of, of American history after the Civil War um, that, you know, to this day, people are, are still, in fact, like with the George Floyd protests and stuff, like this book had another kind of moment where people were like, you know, if you really want to understand America, you got to go back to this period, you know, in the 1860s and 1870s. And the best book that was ever written about that is by Du Bois. And Du Bois basically argued, you know, so that 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 African American uh, slaves had um, earned their freedom during the Civil War by running away from the Southern plantations and joining the Union Army. So he starts off the book with like this counter narrative. You know, we're all taught from like, you know, the time we're like five years old in America that like. Lincoln freed the slaves, Lincoln freed the slaves, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation and so on and so forth. And Du Bois is saying, actually, no, the, the slaves kind of freed themselves in the sense that in 1862, uh, more and more slaves started 
running away from the plantations, joining up with the Union Army, or, you know, <clears throat> basically Du Bois calls this the America's first general strike in the sense that, you know, you had um, this, this massive withdrawal of labor that had, you know, been the backbone of the Southern system. Um, and that was what really was kind of like the decisive turning point in why, how, how the North won the Civil War. Um, and, you know, so when Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, what he's doing is, is more kind of a, a reaction or a response to what had already happened the previous year, the, the movement that had been initiated by enslaved people, right? Um, and so this was, you know, a, a kind of a, a decisive factor in allowing the North to defeat the South. As far as the tragedy that comes after and the tragedy that we are still living with in America in 2021, <clears throat> to explain how the uh, slave was set free, but then pushed back into slavery. Um, du Bois invokes this concept he calls the racial wage. He says, like, you know, after the Civil War, um, there was a possibility for, um, you know, white and black labor to come together to uh, create a new kind of more equitable system. You know, say, for example, where uh, formerly enslaved people might have gotten the 40 acres and a mule that had once been, you know, promised them. Um, and that had been sort of implemented in some parts in the Civil War and then you know, taken back. Um, but there was a possibility that America could have come out of the Civil War as a very different society. Um, that, and, and one in which we could have tried to put um, the legacy of race, uh, of racism behind us. But that didn't happen. Uh, du Bois says that basically what happened was, you know, the ways in which like race um, and what he calls like, you know, the racial wage or the, the wages of whiteness um, is the way a, a later author named David Rodiger put it. Um, the wages of whiteness, a, a symbolic bribe of whiteness was used to basically um, fracture any potential unity of interests between white and black workers um, and to uh, give white workers a kind of symbolic investment in their whiteness that aligned them with the interests of the ruling class. And this has been basically the story of American society and American capitalism and American racial capitalism ever since. Um, has been this this sort of um, the way in which uh, race and racism is used continually to um, against class interests, against the potential for people uniting on the basis of their common class interests, and the way in which race. Uh, and, and this uh, racial wage of whiteness continually gets um, white working class people and white poor people, white middle class people on the side of the white ruling class. This is just a picture from, um, you know, the, the arming of the uh, formerly enslaved people who had you know run away uh, or you know left the southern plantations, joined up with the Union Army, started to form their own regiments. Um, at first, like Lincoln and the uh, the Union Army and the federal government were kind of hesitant about arming um, black people um, and allowing them to fight in the Union Army. Um, but in time, as you know, the losses mounted 
you know, and, and people were dying, people were being wounded and there were, you know, uh, there was an obvious military kind of need. Um, these black soldiers basically went in and, you know, kind of like forced Lincoln's hand. Um, and like I said, they were the, um, the decisive turning point in what was, you know, a war that, that at first the, the South was winning, you know, in 1861 and throughout, you know, a lot of 1862, the Confederate army was, was winning that war. Um, and it, things didn't really start to turn around until, you know, late 1862, 1863, 1864. So, um, as far as, you know, what Du Bois is saying about, and again, like to take a kind of an internationalist perspective on this, um, at the end of Black Reconstruction, at the end of this, this, this epic, but tragic uh, historical narrative, Du Bois says the emancipation of man is the emancipation of labor and the emancipation of labor is the freeing of that basic majority of workers who are yellow, brown, and black, right? So again, the ways in which race and class are inextricably linked, the way in which um, you, one must take an internationalist kind of perspective on this, um, all of these elements are kind of brought together in this, uh, in this work on black reconstruction. Um, after this period through the 1930s, I mean, Du Bois, I mean, remember, it's just a remarkable life of struggle that this man led. Um, you know, he uh, was fired from Atlanta University based on his opposition to the United States' entry into World War II. And then, um, you know, uh, return to his affiliation with the NAACP. Um, with the NAACP, he serves as a delegate for the conference in San Francisco that leads to the founding of the United Nations. In the United Nations, he petitions the UN um, uh, um, regarding discrimination against uh, Black Americans in this report called We Charge Genocide. And then uh, in the early 1950s, he again becomes a, a target of the United States government um, and particularly the McCarthyist, um, you know, anti-communist witch hunts that were pervasive in the US uh, in the late 40s and early 50s. So Du Bois is targeted because of his socialist leanings and his anti-war and peace activism. Um, at that time, you know, the McCarthyists, the, the anti-communists kind of lumped together the peace activists and the socialists um, in terms of, you know, their uh, efforts to spy on them, to censor them, to get them fired from their jobs, um, this whole kind of um, witch hunt that happened in the early 50s. The boys believed uh, increasingly that Marx was right in terms of identifying capitalism as the main cause of poverty and of racism. So his, as we will see, his, um, he, he only became more and more Marxist with age, basically. Um, so he becomes this sort of target here. Sorry about the little repetition from the last slide. Um, then, I mean, you gotta love the guy at, at 92 years old, <laughs> he decides He's just like, fuck it, I've had enough of America. <laughs> um, and at 92 years old, goes back to, he goes to Ghana. Um, and, you know, remember this is a period where um, there's all these kind of anti-colonial movements and, and freedom uh, struggles in Africa. 
Uh, and so, you know, African people are sort of breaking free from the colonial, uh, the, the European empires that had colonized them. And so this is a, you know, a real kind of um, opening up or a flowering of um, interest in African culture and African history. And so Du Bois goes back to Ghana with the idea that he's gonna um, edit this comprehensive, huge encyclopedia of the African diaspora. How he thought he could do this at the age of 92, I have no idea, but all the more power to you. Um, and then, uh, and then he finally becomes, he officially joins the Communist Party for the first time in Africa. Uh, I guess it's just never too late to join the Communist Party at the age of 93. Um, and he says here, you know, I believe in communism and I mean by communism, a planned way of life in the production of wealth and work designed for building a state whose object is the highest welfare of its people and not merely the profit of a part. And like I said, um, he, uh, he finally dies in, in 1963 in Ghana uh, on the night before the famous March on Washington um, on August 27th, 1963, uh, the, the uh, March on Washington where um, Martin Luther King gives his famous, I have a dream speech. Uh, it's quite an amazing life, like I said, kind of book that bookends the whole, you know, history. I mean, not exactly, but the roughly bookends the, the, the history of Jim Crow uh, in America. So, you know, how do we then situate Du Bois within um, sociology? is the question that we kind of started with here. Um, a few years ago, uh, Alden Douglas Morris, who's a prominent sociologist, who's written a number of books, including a very important book about the civil rights movement. Um, Alden Douglas Morris went and uh, kind of excavated the influence that Du Bois had had on sociology, but the influence that had been like marginalized and, and not recognized. Um, and he basically argued that, you know, Du Bois was the founder of American sociology and that his contributions to the field had been suppressed for decades because of institutional racism. And Morris uh, and a group of uh, his colleagues, uh, his peers persuaded the American Sociological Association to rename their top award after Du Bois. Um, du Morris was um, then uh, elected uh, president of the ASA and currently in 2021 serves as the 112th president of the association. So it, it's kind of one of these things where like, you know, it took over a hundred years <laughs> sociology is, is finally beginning to kind of uh, recognize. Um, and still to this day, this, this is something that, that is still kind of like controversial and contested, um, but uh, something where, you know, finally people are, you know, kind of recognizing the, the contribution that Du Bois made um, not just as an intellectual, because that's well known, you know, lots of people know about Du Bois, but the idea that he is this founding figure in sociology was just not something that like sociology textbooks were, you know, um, were centering as they would say these days. <clears throat> Similarly, um, you know, just as, as, as Du Bois's contribution to the history of sociology had been neglected because of institutional racism, the contributions of, of women to the development of American sociology uh, have also been minimized. Um, this actually, we can go back, you know, to uh, the age of Comte um, with a woman named Harriet Martineau, who was an English woman 
um, who came to the United States in, I believe it was the year 1840, um, certainly sometime uh, in the early 19th century. And she wrote a book called Society in America and, and Martineau is now, you know, considered like um, a founding figure in um, the development of, of sociology in general. She's also the first person to have translated uh, Augusta Comte's works into English. Um, as far as the connection with Chicago, there was also a close connection between um, women who were doing social uh, research in the city of Chicago um, and who were in one way or another connected with the university of, uh, there in Chicago. And they kind of came together in this group called the women, the Chicago Women's School of Sociology. Now, the, the, the important part here is the idea that a lot of these women were doing um, not just social research, but like were involved in like social reform kind of efforts, as we'll see with like um, Jane Addams, you know, where they were, you know, really concerned with um, the welfare of immigrants, um, with with children, um, with you know, like homelessness and poverty, and you know, they they were not just like researching the world; they were they were trying to create a better world uh, or at least a, a less terrible, less bad world. You know, they were social reformers, um, but because uh, they were, you know, engaged in, you know, these reform efforts that tended to kind of marginalize them within sociology as a like scientific academic discipline that was supposed to be objective. So this kind of weird, this, this like gendered um, dynamic takes hold in sociology where like the men are, you know, like the objective scientific, you know, looking at, at uh, the city of Chicago under a microscope, um, but doing it from a kind of a scientific distance. And the women, are you know engaged in social research but also actively trying to reform and change things for the better um and that kind of reform work gets kind of marginalized as non-scientific non-objective and and therefore marginalized kind of out of the discipline of sociology you know, and, and out of the university. So it, it's this kind of gendered dynamic and, and a very like in, unequal gendered dynamic that sort of um, divides sociology and like social reform or like what would later be like social work, you know, and, and to this day, there's that kind of gendered um, inequity in terms of, sociology being thought of as something objective and scientific and therefore male and uh, social work as being uh, something that you know is is not those is, is not objective or not um, scientific so just as there's been these efforts by like Alden Douglas Morris and other people to kind of rehabilitate the the central role of of um, Du Bois in founding sociology. There's also been efforts to try to rehabilitate the role that women have played in the founding of sociology. So the, this text, The Women Founders, um, was among you know the, these works that, that sought to, to, to counteract this neglect that women's roles, uh, you know, that women had played in the development of sociology. Um, the Chicago Women's School of Sociology was basically this network of women who wanted to produce a body of sociology that, you know, again, linked social theory, research, and social reform. So they had a lot of the same aims as like the Chicago School uh, people in terms of wanting to engage not just with research, but with theory. 
Um, but, you know, they were perhaps, unlike the Chicago school, interested in, in actively being like social reformers. And so the, the body of work that was produced by these women, um, you know, again, like kind of overlaps with the Chicago school and this whole period we've been talking about with Du Bois, you know, roughly between the, the last decade of the 19th, 19th century and the, the first, you know, two decades of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, it was based out of the University of Chicago. Uh, many of them had attended graduate school there, but it was also linked to um, this famous settlement house, a uh, whole house that had been established by Jane Adams that was basically, you know, there to, to, to serve these, you know, the, this flood of, of immigrants who, who were coming to the city of Chicago to work in industry, you know, many of them from um, Eastern Europe um, and people who had, you know, basically just arrived in Chicago with like, you know, nothing um, and not able to speak English and, you know, had come as like unskilled laborers. And so the settlement house was, the, the, the whole house was like um, an attempt to you know, provide services and to, you know, like improve the conditions of, you know, people who were like uh, the working poor, the, um, uh, the sort of the unskilled immigrant labor in the city of Chicago. So this dynamic between Hull House and the University of Chicago, you know, it, proved in some cases to be successful and to yield some fruit um, from it. The, the women involved in the project were able to incorporate social theory learned at the university and at the same time gaining practical experience outside in uh, urban Chicago and, and its surrounding counties. Uh, a couple of women that we'll um, look at more closely here. Uh, Jane Adams, very well-known, famous social reformer, um, in many ways, you know, one of the, a pioneering figure in in social work. Um, she was the founder of Whole House, um, that you know played this really important role in connecting social research and social reform. It was founded in 1901. Uh, uh, was this um, this uh, this committee, the juvenile court committee, that was concerned especially with the um, the the fate of, of children? If to remember here, we're talking about like you know all of these, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you know this huge flood of immigrants coming to the city of Chicago, and um, many of them desperate, poor, unskilled. Um, and, you know, working in factories, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And so their children might be uh, unsupervised, you know, throughout most of the day. Um, there was, you know, a lot of like, you know, gangs that were starting to form and, and that kind of thing in Chicago. And so the, um, there was a real concern for like, you know, the children um, in, these, in these neighborhoods and in these communities. So Adams and her colleagues founded the Juvenile Court Committee, uh, which provided the first uh, probation officers for the first juvenile court uh, in the United States. And from the um, period from 1907 until the 1940s, this um, JPA engaged in many studies that, that examined subjects like racism, child labor, exploitation, drug abuse, prostitution, all of these things that we know um, go hand in hand with uh, poverty and um, urban uh, settings. And so all of these things became subjects for both social research and 
social reform. In 1931, Adams became the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize um, as recognition for these efforts. And like I said, she's still recognized as, you know, like perhaps the founder of the social work profession in the United States. Um, but again, the, the problem is, is like, you know, Jane Addams, much like W.E.B. Du Bois, is a very famous uh, person, probably much more well known than like Max Weber or Emile Durkheim. Um, but not, but their, her role in the development of sociology, again, is like marginalized. Like you're not gonna find her usually talked about in like sociology textbooks as like um, a, a, as one of these founding figures, right? Again, because of this kind of division between, you know, scientific sociology and um, which is, you know, coded as male and um, social reform, which is coded as female, because of that, um, there's been this kind of institutional discrimination in which the role of Adams and, and so many other women like her has been um, left out of the story of the development of American sociology and uh, the um, Chicago School. Likewise with uh, Florence Kelly, um, you know, just like, you know, the, the Chicago Women's uh, School of Sociology, um, you know, in addition to this, borrowed a lot of ideas from Marxist socialism and Marxist theory, um, as you would if you're in an environment of tremendous inequality and uh, exploitation of workers and, you know, um, cities like Chicago, where you see so much poverty and desperation, but also so much like wealth and um, prosperity. So one woman who, you know, had studied socialism at the University of Zurich and uh, came to play an important role in Chicago was Florence Kelly. Um, and, you know, what she had said was that, you know, economic class position as the main variable explaining the human misery they saw around them, unfettered capitalist greed as the primary cause of misery. So this is the way in which like these women who were dealing, you know, as like social workers on a day-to-day -day basis with all of these social problems that we see in cities to this day, um, were drawn to these insights of Marxist theory and uh, in some cases drawn to uh, Marxist political conclusions about the need for, you know, a transformation of the capitalist economy into something more uh, socialist and something more humane. So, you know, it's kind of high time that we um, recognize the role of, um, of, of these folks in developing sociology and kind of try to break down this long-standing barrier that has separated, you know, uh, scientific sociology from something that is, you know, kind of dismissed as like social reform or social work. All right, I hope that that has been useful for you and I will see you next time. Bye.